Yes. <laughs> All right. Good day, everyone. It's um, my name's Leanne Mitchell, and I'm from the Australia Institute's Tasmania branch. And uh, welcome to our COVID-safe politics in the pub. I uh, hope you're all surviving lockdown. I'm actually doing my lockdown in my pub in um, Hobart, Nipaluna, on the side of Kunanyi, Mount Wellington. And I'm on the, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Palawa people of Tasmania Lutrawitra, Lutrawitra, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, right, and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded, and this land is Aboriginal land and always will be. So for our first politics in the pub, we've started off with a technical hitch, um, some, some <laughs> Sam Maiden was supposed to join us, but she's had trouble dialing in. I hope she overcomes the technical difficulties because at 6.45, she was actually going to nick off to do a Facebook Live with the Prime Minister. So we were going to be the warm-up act for Sam, um, but never mind, because we have the wonderful Amy Ramikas with us tonight from The Guardian. Thanks, Amy, for coming and welcome. Um, uh, Amy, it's really here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Amy does the hugely popular uh, politics live. Is that what it's called, Amy? The the blog. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, and was uh, also nominated for a youth uh, a Walkley Youth Awards, I believe. And oh, has... so many years ago, it's not worth mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's an award claimant, um, and has done not just politics federally, but politics in Queensland. Also done some Queensland greatest reporting. nation on earth. <laughs> Um, and so I'd like to welcome all of the members and supporters of the Australia Institute that have come in tonight. And I'd particularly like to give a shout out to those uh, members and supporters that have come in, zoomed in from regional Australia, straight in via the web to, in, to right inside the Canberra bubble. It's pretty exciting for us being able to talk to press gallery journalists. Um, and I'm wondering, Amy, before we get sort of stuck into you know, your view on how the government's going to handling the pandemic, both the health and economic crisis. How are you handling the pandemic and the lockdown? Because I imagine it'd be pretty crazy working in the press gallery with no parliamentarians. And I must say, I did notice you were wearing your pyjamas on Insiders the other day. So how's it going for you? Yeah, I mean, me wearing my pyjamas to work is not actually unusual. I do that quite frequently so <laughs> I don't think any of my colleagues were surprised to see that um I guess I'm I guess I'm the same as everyone I, I think with with the self-isolation everyone's sort of gone on their own sort of path with this and everyone's had peaks and troughs where you're like this is okay and then you realize oh wow like is this the new normal and it gets a bit low um I I'm an extrovert, so I charge, I recharge by having a lot of interactions with people. So that's been slightly um, difficult at times. But I think the hardest part uh, for me were just small beans in the scheme of things because my heart is with everyone who's lost their job or lost their business mm. or has just seen their lives just completely completely alter from the path that they were on on February so very small beans but um it's quite strange being locked out of your home I can't enter Queensland uh without a permit it's strange thinking I can't go see my dad uh it's strange just knowing that uh, if I wanted to go home that I couldn't and also as, as a journalist you never really have the luxury of looking away so I've spent the last seven or so weeks uh, on the live coverage and mm. I love I love my job and I love live coverage and I love the Guardian blog community but it means that from 5 30 when I wake up in the morning I am all over absolutely everything and I never quite get to switch off so mm. you start to realize that because you can't look away uh, it starts to go into all other parts of your life as well. So it's just about finding that balance, which I think everyone is kind of working out how to do at the moment. Uh, and like I said, it, it's a very small complaint in the scheme of things. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing I have forgotten, sorry for everybody out there Zooming in, I should have gone through the rules of Zoom or some tips on how to Zoom. 
Um, I'm just showing my L plate now because I've, this is the first time I've hosted a Zoom webinar. I listen to Ebony do them expertly at once a week. We've got a really good series on um, the economics of the pandemic. But um, just so people know that you can go to the Q&A, if you hover down the bottom of your screen and go across where the Q&A is, you can put questions on there that we'll try and get to. Um, there's also a chat function where you can talk to each other. Um, in the Q&A, you, you can actually put your, raise your hand and I'll try and get to some of you in the second half. Um, who knows, we might be able to get a few more questions. Oh, you're, you're flashing your great screenshot again, Amy. Amy on the table with a wine. Um, uh, to get to get through, and if the chat goes off tap, we'll we'll shut it down. But we haven't had to do that so far. But apparently, some Zoom chats can get trolls and and whatnot in there. And we are recording this, I think. Ebony, is that right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. And we'll send it out to people who emailed and registered after we finished. So, on to the um, the government's response to COVID nineteen to the pandemic. Um, I think pretty much everybody is in agreement that they've done a good job with flattening the curve and the health response. And now they're starting to look at how they'll deal with the economic response. The, the framing and the, the debate has really shifted to that. And it seems to me like they're not talking about a snapback anymore. So they've got over this, you know, kind of, we're just going to snap back to normality. But what they're not doing, um, and I'm interested in your insights on this, Amy, is that they're not actually talking about what they will be doing. So what are the stimulus packages that they'll be, they'll be running out? They're pretty good at telling the states what to do and what restrictions they should lift, but what do you see coming for the um, actual policies for stimulus? I don't think they know what they're right. going to do yet. And I think that's the biggest reason we actually haven't heard what's coming. I mean, we... And we've started seeing them, as you've said, shifting from the health crisis part of this pandemic to the economic crisis. Uh, yesterday, when Josh Frydenberg did his press club address and said that we're losing $4 billion a week uh, in this lockdown. So what the government is doing is basically preparing everyone for the lockdown to be ending. They're sort of saying, you know what? Uh, we've, we've done what we wanted to do in suppressing the curve. Uh, we've not going to be able to maintain this for much longer. So everyone needs to get used to living in a sort of virus economy because nothing is going to go back to what we knew it as being remotely normal until we have a vaccine. So Australia is going to be living as Jacinda Ardern like saying in a, in a bubble, sort of within a bubble. But the government doesn't know what it is what it's facing in terms of how it responds. It doesn't know what supply chains are going to be open. Mm. The fact that the US has capitulated so terribly to this virus has to be sending alarm bells throughout Canberra because they're our biggest ally and they're not doing the one job that you would expect your allies to do, which is to protect your own people. The US has failed at that. They've seen the UK really, really shudder when it comes to that. They're seeing Europe that's still struggling with it. Uh, we don't really know what the situation is in China because you don't know the truth of what's happening in those authoritarian regimes. So. Australia's trading partners at the moment are a mess, so we don't know what the option is there. We don't know the option is uh, in terms of manufacturing in Australia. We've heard a lot about a self-sufficient economy during the last couple of weeks, but for Australia to be at all competitive or successful on manufacturing front, you would need the, um, a lot of government subsidies to make that worthwhile. And the government is now starting to say, well, you know what, we don't have the money to do all of the things that we need to do. And we also have to remember that they've set a hard deadline themselves for all the stimulus packages that they've put out so far of September 24. So that's when the COVID supplement that's doubled the new start, now job seeker allowance runs out. That's when a lot of the stimulus packages run out September 24. But we're not gonna suddenly see the unemployment rate go back to about 5%. It's going to stay uh, 7, 10% for quite, for quite some time. So you're going to have quite a lot of businesses that have had to close down, quite a lot of people aren't out of work, um, a lower unemployment, employment payment and for at least the first financial year a government unsure of what it needs to do to react oh right so it's um 
with no plan, if they, if they actually don't have a plan, it's hard to sell one then, I suppose, isn't it? It's uh, not overly yeah, it's, reassuring. It, it's not entirely their fault at the moment that they don't have a plan because I know yeah. we've heard this word unprecedented a lot, but this really is unprecedented for them. It is bigger than the global financial crisis. The arse fell out of the global economy overnight mm. and everywhere. There's no mm. beams of light anywhere. And you can't go back to the way things were. During the GFC, we still had the Reserve Bank that had quite a few triggers to pull. We've had low wage growth. We've had low economic growth. And the RBA has done literally everything it could do in the last few years to try and keep Australia's economy afloat. It's now reached its ceiling. There's not a lot left for the RBA to do. So that takes away all of those answers. We don't know, uh, like I said, we don't know what our trading partners are doing. So that takes up a lot there. We don't know uh, if our resources are going to be needed. So that takes away a lot there. So suddenly everything Australia had to offer to keep the economy afloat has disappeared and we're not alone. It's happened all across the world. So I think the only way out of this is some big thinking and it's going to have to be different to all the other answers that we've seen before. We have to go onto a different path. We have to pursue different industries. And you're starting to see that organically anyway. I, I notice in social media, a lot of people are starting to talk that way. You're starting to mm. hear it in some of the politicians. The Greens have been very big on this. Labor is starting to talk about it as well. You're seeing some rogue nationals and liberal MPs sort of saying, what can Australia do that's different to what we've done? That seems to be where the plan should go. At the moment, though, the government's just kind of like, everything's on the table, <laughs> so let's see what sticks. It is, you're right, Amy, it is unprecedented. Um, there's a couple of people that are just in the Q&A asking where Sam Maiden is. So just for people who came in late, Sam, um, we're having some technical difficulties, so she couldn't zoom in. She's going to maybe try and come in as an average punter and then Ebony will do a magic and upper to a panellist. Um, and she did have to go and speak to the PM at 6.45 for a Facebook Live. So oh, um, she might be coming in now. Um, I heard she is. You just heard yeah. Sam Maiden. <laughs> It's okay, it's a Samantha <laughs> Mark. No one wants to hear me ramble on <laughs> No, Amy, don't go anywhere. Um, so for a government without a plan, they're pretty popular. Like the, you know, the, the polling is just extraordinary at the moment for the popularity of the government. It kind of fits in. The Australia Institute did some international polling last week that showed this is a trend across the world. Like even Trump is getting relatively high scores. People really want government to lead on this recovery. Um, but I'm also wondering how long that can last, given that all of those things that you talked about and the fact that now with 50% of people of working age being unemployed and so many not being caught by JobKeeper and the Treasurer seems to change that a little bit, you know, over the past few days, he keeps cutting it back. How, how, how does the government maintain their you know, the love of the people, um, given all of that going on, do you think? It's probably important to note that it's not so much the government that seems to be popular. I mean, even news poll showed that any gains that they made at the beginning of uh, the pandemic about, uh, let's say a month ago, a beginning of the hard lockdowns in Australia about a month ago, ago have reversed uh, already but Scott Morrison's popularity has shot through the roof and that's understandable. Kevin Rudd's person, popular, personal popularity also mm. shot through the roof at one stage because we're seeing him every day. He's, you know, being calm. He's not picking fights with people. Yeah. Uh, he's doing his job, which, you know, in this country is enough Good. for a few got one. points. <laughs> <laughs> exactly at this point um so but that is that hasn't translated to the government being popular um but at the same time a lot of that is because we haven't had any politics for the last yeah. six weeks six to eight weeks which is a good thing this country does not need politics it didn't need politics during the bushfire it needed leadership it took 
from a while to actually learn that lesson. We were very, very slow to respond at the beginning. I mean, I think everyone remembers uh, a week before, you know, the big lockdowns, we were still being told it was fine to go to the football and everyone should go and go and do that. And then suddenly there was a switch and it all, it all got to where it needed to be. But as you point out, we are in for a wild, terrible ride over the next couple of years. It's going to be absolutely awful. And there are going to be a lot of decisions made that are going to hurt people. I mean, the government right now is really stuck on the idea that uh, it needs to stop the COVID supplement on September 24. Like, that's it. It's six months. Uh, who can go back to living on $40 a day? It was unlivable mm. before there was a, a global economic crisis. It's going to be unlivable, like, absolutely now. And the government has acknowledged that it's unlivable because the moment the unemployment rate doubled, they suddenly found the money to be able to, like, double the unemployment payment because they were like, we, you know, we have to keep the economy afloat. And the reason that advocates, including the business community, have pushed so hard to have New Start increased is because we know that people who are on New Start, who are on the pension, spend that money in the community. They don't bank it because they can't. They need to buy the essentials. They need to put a roof over their head. They need to be able to use public transport. So all of that money that goes to somebody who is on our social security safety net gets spent straight back in the economy, which keeps all of the business community afloat. So if they stop that payment and suddenly you have all of these people who have never been on unemployment benefits before, who understand how difficult living just above the poverty line is. And let's be clear, $1,100 a fortnight is not swimming in cash. You are barely keeping your head above water at that rate. So you've got all of these people who suddenly realize, hey, this isn't easy. How on earth am I going to live if you take even a couple of hundred dollars away from me? If you have the job keeper rate thing, so all of a sudden you have businesses who have had um, an absolute clusterfuck getting on to this system, having to pay out all of this money to their employees and are now waiting to see if they're even eligible for the government assistance. Uh, if you're, and, and suddenly discovering you need to take out a business loan to be able to keep your business afloat. You've got all of these people who suddenly just go, it stops, the government mm. turns off the tap, but the economy is not ready to support them. So that is going to be a really, really tricky time for politics in Australia, and deservedly so, because we cannot leave 50% of our population floundering. And at the moment, that's what we're being told they're going to do. There is no snapback. It is impossible. You cannot have a snapback. Nothing is going back to normal once the restrictions are lifted. There is no sense of normality until there is a vaccine. The economy is not gonna suddenly just recover you have seen businesses lose tens of thousands of dollars. You have seen people lose their homes and all of a sudden you're going to expect life just to go back to normal. I can, yeah. I, I can absolutely guarantee, and I worked in hospitality for you know more, more than a decade. I know what hospitality is like. I can absolutely guarantee that there are going to be people who do not feel safe going out in crowds until there is a vaccine. We're not suddenly going to become immune to this if you're vulnerable. So yeah. all of a sudden you see restaurants have their numbers drops. The arts have had the arse fall out of them because, you know, lo and behold, the governments haven't been managed to find money for them. So who mm. is going to afford to be able to pay our artist community? <laughs> so you're not going to have people going out for that, which means you're also going to have the bars that are going to start to struggle. You have people on a casual wage who can't spend money. The retail shops start to mm. struggle. Then suddenly you kind of go, holy shit, everything has fallen apart. And we don't have an answer for that yet. <laughs> I can see why you get, you know, concerned and, and a little bit, you know, skewed in your mind when you have to track this 24-7, Amy. Um, and I'm wondering, in the age of, you know, bipartisanship and not having politics, um, and I agree with you, and, and I think 
you know, that Scott Morrison kind of really learned his lesson from Hawaii and the fires, and maybe that helped with the fast response here. Which Sam Maiden was great on, so I'm sorry that you guys didn't get to hear from her. <laughs> I know, I had a question on it for her. Um, but what, what do you do if you're an opposition party? What, I mean, what do you do if you're Jim Chalmers or Anthony Albanese? Well, look, you advocate for the people who are forgotten. That's what you do. Like... We have to remember that when the restrictions lift, and I've seen a couple of questions there about like, why can't we live in the new normal without a vaccine? When the restrictions are relaxed, it's not because we've eradicated the virus. It's, it's impossible to eradicate the virus until we have, you know, a vaccine. And even then people are still going to, you know, catch it. Not everybody uh, can develop an immunity even with vaccines. And we see how quickly this, this virus duplicates. Uh, you know, you can see one person has it, then three, and then six, and then all before you know it, you know, you've got a thousand people. What is happening when we relax, relax the restrictions is we have decided that our healthcare system can handle what's coming, that we suppress the curve enough that where, where it reaches, we think you can do localized lockdowns and that sort of thing, but where the curve reaches now is something that our healthcare system can handle, not, not society at large. And essentially what you're seeing around the world, uh, UK starting to talk about, you know, when we're going to lift the lockdown, you're seeing what's happening in the US we're seeing populations deciding that they're comfortable with the death rate that comes with this virus and that it's no longer enough to be locked down with, that we're reaching a point where we're kind of going, maybe we should just live with that. And that's a really privileged position to live in because if we say um, for the States, for example, uh, when you're having all of these people who are advocating, you know, to go back and live, live their lives, they're actually just advocating for the service workers to come back to work and serve mm. them. So the most vulnerable people. In Australia, we're not quite that selfish, thank God, uh, or, or that assholery. And it is because we have <laughs> a better healthcare system and we have uh, a better social security safety net. Uh, certainly not as good as it could be, but especially since it's been doubled, it's, it's a lot, a lot more beneficial. But there are so many people who have been left out of that. And there is going to be so many more people who are going to be suffering once September 24 rolls around and all of this stops, once the economy doesn't kick in. And that's what you need a strong opposition for. That's when you need people to step up mm. and go, these people have been forgotten. Nobody wants politics. Nobody wants fighting because it doesn't matter who can scream the loudest it matters how effectual you are and it makes sense that we haven't actually heard a lot from any you know opposing politicians except saying you know we agree with the government doing this this is how we think you could improve it but they're not picking fights because nobody wants to see mum and dad fighting when the car is careening off a cliff you want to think that somebody is actually in control of the wheel and probably the greatest thing that we've seen happen is the national cabinet where we've had voices from all across australia the state and territory leaders saying this is what's happening in my area this is what i think needs to happen and having that uniform idea kind of you know being filtered out across the country but we're going to reach a point where we actually need people saying, you know what, we're living whatever this new normal is, but we have Bob down the road who can't pay his rent. We have the people who suffered during the bushfires who still are living in tents. We have, you know, Marge who can't get a job and also is not qualifying for any of our social security. We have massive, massive, like, issues with the banks over here. We have debt defaulting over here and we need politicians to come together and debate the best way out of that so you're mm. starting to see it i wish we weren't seeing it in an attack on temporary migrants because mm. that's not the issue here i wish we were actually starting to look at this holistically which is how are we going to drag australia through this and that is going to take something that's going to need a hell of a lot of voices yeah I've got quite a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to ask a few in a minute, but I might, I think Ebony's got one for you first. 
Yes, uh, <clears throat> privilege of being a, a co-host. Amy, I just was really interested in what you were saying there about we haven't been doing politics as usual and that example of the national cabinet, but also, you know, the opposition playing a little bit of a different role here. But it also strikes me that we've seen a bit of an explosion of politics in the last 24 to 48 hours with the news of the Eden Monero by-election. <laughs> um, <laughs> how long is this? little bubble so to speak that we've created of not politics as usual going to will it will it last through a by-election no it won't it's not going to last through the first <laughs> week of parliament when parliament goes back next week i mean it's the nationals like just to go off covid for a second the nationals are just such a great national disappointment because they represent the poorest electorates in australia the poverty and the issues in the electorates that they represent is just mind-bogglingly, heart-achingly tragic. And the fact that when they first came back to Parliament this year and we were meant to be having a day acknowledging just how terrible the bushfires were, they decided to have a leadership challenge, says everything about the Nationals this, in this iteration. It's just absolutely fucked. It makes no sense because it's just them proving that they're only representing themselves and their own political career. And it drives me insane. Eden Monaro is a very, very difficult electorate and it has suffered. It has really, really suffered with drought, with the bushfires, with COVID, with closures of industries. It's not, it's not an easy fix. And the fact that We've got, in the last 24 hours, we've had somebody say, I'm not running because of my family. Thank you very much. You know, I, it's not the right time. Somebody else stand up and say, I will be running. There's a lot I can do here. I'm very passionate about this community. And then magically, we have text messages appear in the media attacking Michael McCormack, who anyone who reads my blog knows I am not a fan of. I think he is completely ineffectual in his role and he could be doing so much better as the leader of a party that is meant to represent some of the most poor among us that's a side issue but suddenly we have that issue exploding because someone's all butt hurt that they didn't get enough of a you know of a of a standing ovation that they were thinking about putting their hand up and then you have the candidate who was going to put their hand up going actually no whoop, 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 i'm just going to back out of this trash fire and leave you guys to it and we're even talking about it now is absolutely ridiculous Politicians need to stop being butthurt over whatever is happening in their own sphere and maybe just look at the peripherals and just think, oh, maybe there's a better use of my time here. So next week, uh, Parliament is back for the first time in a proper sitting since this all started in February. I think Parliament probably should have continued sitting the entire time. Uh, it sat during war, it sat during the Spanish flu. I do think we need those checks and balances. Uh, I think we probably could have come up with other ways, like what we did with what we've seen in Welsh and Irish parliaments in terms of zooming in. I mean, it probably would have provided a few laughs because I'm sure there's many people who couldn't work out how to un unmute a microphone in that backbench, but you know, uh, I think it probably should have sat, but I also think you're starting to see Labor were up the outrage uh, handle a little bit on what's coming with the economy, because the economy is a lot uh, safer topic for everyone to be angry and fighting about than people's health. Mm. And Amy, are you willing to now publicly rule out for running for Eden Monaro yourself? <laughs> Look, I'm going to have some personal conversations um, <laughs> with you know, yourself. take some counsel uh, and then make a decision when I'm ready to, uh, to, to make that in my own time. Oh, great. Um, we've got a hand up from Heather McLaughlin. Heather, if you're still there, I might come back to you in a minute and you can ask the question yourself. And I've got a question from Emma Kate Rose and she would like to know, what the view from the pe what's the view from the press gallery regarding the influence of the mining slash anti renewables lobby on the post COVID nineteen economic recovery? Well, it's not like a um, 
I can't speak for everyone in the press gallery. We don't get together and have meetings and work out what our positions are on things, although I'm sure sometimes it seems that way, but I can assure you that does not happen. Um, I can only speak from my view, uh, which is as an observer, as it is uh, as for all of you, it just, um, I tend to have to watch it a little bit more closely. I think you're going to hear the usual suspects definitely step up uh, and start screaming very loudly on this topic. Uh, you may have heard Josh Frydenberg yesterday point out that 85% of mining businesses were able to keep uh, working during the lockdown. So you're going to hear a lot about how these businesses are helping to keep the economy afloat. But I would also say people should maybe have a look at what's happening in, in the UK where they recently wrote, um, broke their day on day record. I think they're on day 25 now where they haven't used any coal at all uh, to run. And that's just where the world is going. And Australia may be dragged kicking and screaming, but Australia will have to get there as well. Before anyone asks me about 30% of the UK's power is coming from nuclear, which is about the same as wind in the UK at the moment. Australia has the capabilities. I think you're going to hear a lot more uh, about lithium in, in the coming uh, couple of years, about the lithium industry that Australia can start up in terms of batteries. I think one of the greatest things uh, that could happen in terms of Australia realising that maybe it needs to be a little bit more self-sufficient in its supply chains is that everyone has sort of realised just how much Australia has has um, allowed to go offshore in these industries, uh, just how much of Australia's own resources for the renewables we don't own and maybe bring back some of that capability. But don't expect the mining industry to, to go down without a fight and don't expect the politicians who have been very, very loud advocates of the mining and resources industry, many of them nationals, MPs, who should maybe think about what it's doing to the rest of their constituents, don't expect them to shut up anytime soon either. Thanks, Amy. Heather, are you there? No? Okay. Um, I'll take another question from the Q&A chat. Um, well, this is actually a follow on, I guess, from the last one. What do you think the chances are the government will listen to climate science in the same way as they have the science about the virus? Surely we need some version of a Green New Deal like South Korea is doing. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. And I think that uh, it's been... It's been really heartening to see our leaders saying we need to listen to the experts and actually take that expert advice. Uh, it's been really good that we've stopped having field opinions run policy in this country and actually gone, this is what we need to do, even if it's, uh, even if it's, if it's difficult, even if it means that we're going to feel some short-term pain, which is what's happened in, in what's been termed the great lockdown. Uh, I think that we're going, well, I don't think, I hope we have a more rational uh, political debate moving forward where we do listen to the climate scientists. The problem with that though, and the, one of the main reasons we haven't been listening to the climate scientists is that unlike a health pandemic, which is right in front of you, it's on your doorstep, it's happening in real time, climate can be put off for administrations. A 2030 is quite a long way away, Scott Morrison, probably won't be Prime Minister in 2030. So I don't think he actually cares whether we meet our 2030 targets or not. Mm. And that's one of the issues with climate science and one of the issues with climate politics in this country is that it's not immediately an issue for them. It's somebody else's problem and they let it be somebody else's problem because it's politically expedient for them to do that. So I hope they start listening more to the experts. I hope that people start demanding that they listen more to the experts. Mm. I remember when I thought 2020 was like a lifetime away and that we'd never get to 2020, but here we are. And we never mm. would have guessed that 2020 would kick off like this. Yeah. I'm going to, Ashley, I hope that you're still there. You've got your hand up if you'd like to ask your question. I'm going to take another one from the Role, and then Ashley, I'm going to come back to you. Um, there's quite a few people here voting for this question. It's love to hear your thoughts about the universal minimum wage as a new normal approach. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's another really, really interesting point. And I think the fact that 
the government immediately doubled uh, Job Seeker to $1,100 a fortnight shows you that they are also aware of the economic benefits of a universal basic income. Uh, I have I have always thought it's something that Australia should pursue, whether it be through the social uh, safety net or whether it be just through, uh, you know, paying us paying that certain amount so that whatever people earn on top of it means that you know rent is paid, you know, you've got something for schooling, that sort of thing. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't. Uh, and I think that's because uh, it's, it's politically too difficult. Uh, it's something that would take a generational change in thinking, which is really, really difficult to bring about. Uh, and I think you can sort of see that uh, with just how often it's, well, just how hard it's been for us to change societal norms in this country. I'm thinking of the Indigenous vote. Uh, indigenous recognition, uh, just those sorts of things that you would think would be a no-brainer, but it's 2020 and here we are. Uh, also, there's the issues that we're not living, we're not going to be living in a normal economy. We're going to be living uh, closer to something that we saw with the Great Depression. You've got issues of inflation. You've got issues of whether we need to move away from this idea of, um, of using interest rates to kind of cut uh, or kind of deal with um, uh, monetary policy and whether we should be moving into something like full employment, which actually will help the economy a lot more. So I think a, a UBI is very interesting. I don't actually think it will happen because of Australian politics and uh, just uh, the age of Australia's uh, population. It's going to be very difficult to convince uh, uh, an ageing population that this is something that needs to happen. Uh, but I do definitely think that there needs to be more advocating to keep our safety net payment at a level that it is now and increase it in real terms because it is going to be catastrophic to have that dropped down to $550 a fortnight. Yeah, well, I, I can't see how they can do it morally or politically. It's not to say that they won't do it, but um, it, it would be crazy to go back down there again. But it, I mean, you did say before, Amy, that you think we're gonna have to have big policy ideas and visions coming out. Um, I wonder, I'll go to Ashley now to ask her question, but maybe um, just throwing it out there for you and for people on the line. What is the big policy visions that we can see? If, you, if UBI's a no-goer, and I'm, I'm kind of with you on that one, um, it's in, you know interesting to think about what are the big policy visions that are most likely to get up if it's more than just, you know, sort of tinkering around the edges. But I, I might just leave that one hanging because Ashley, I, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thank you. Um, tomorrow's coming up to eight weeks off the road for me as a rideshare driver doing rideshare to try to make ends meet because I was one of those people where New Start, you know, barely paid one week's rent, let alone two. Um, and, you know, apart from the one off $750, which was, you know, a, a good stock gap, I, I don't know if I was the only one who got the impression that the funding was going to accrue from when he announced it and start actually flowing, you know, from the 27th of April. But I haven't seen a cent other than that $750 yet. Um, it's the first lots coming through next week for me. And, you know, I'm paying my rent. My last savings are out the window now, completely gone, and I've been paying rent on my credit card. Um, you know, am I the only one who got the idea that they were actually going to backdate this to when the announcement was made? Because they were talking about six months worth of funding and by my reckoning that's only five months because one month's already gone. Mm. Yeah, no, you're not the only one and I'm very, very sorry uh, that that has happened. Um, but you're not the only one who had that impression. I think that the announcements were coming out so thick and fast. Uh, there was l less than two weeks between the first stimulus announcement of that $750 and the second one of, you know, we're doubling this and we're putting in, you know, JobKeeper and we're doing this and yada, 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 uh, because it was moving so fast, uh, but they didn't have the systems ready, as we know. So they, uh, they sort of let it be assumed, I think, that it was going 
to start immediately or be backdated. Uh, I remember that I was reporting like what dates that it would be rolling through, but there's only so much information that people can be taking in. And I've had to tell several friends about what was happening just as uh, there's a lot of people who aren't aware of the hard cutoff date of September 24. And if your payment falls on the week after that, you'll only get half of what you'd be getting, not the full amount because they've stopped the COVID supplement. So yeah, you're not, you're not alone. And I'm really sorry that that's happened. Mm. Um, I'm going to go to Mel to ask your question directly, Mel, after this one. So get ready if you're still there. Um, but we do have an epidemiologist with us. And um, she said, I think it's she, um, said that uh, she hates to keep harping on about this, but it's unlikely that we'll get a vaccine anytime soon. And does anybody know of a plan B? You're getting the hard questions tonight, Amy. I just, or maybe it's just run for Eden Monaro. Oh, you got I my am, vote. <laughs> And I am not, I am not a disease expert, so I can only talk to you about, you know, the politics and only the politics as I see it, because obviously I'm not sitting around a cabinet table. Um, plan B is to uh, live as we have been maybe with some looser restrictions. I mean, you're going to see the restrictions be taken off in reverse order. So travel will be one of the last ones. The border closures will be one of the last ones. You'll start to see bigger groups. It wouldn't surprise me if on Friday they announced that they're going to start allowing gatherings of, you know, 10 or more people in certain areas and try to convince people just to wash their hands uh, and to, you know, maintain as much social distance as possible. Uh, there is going to be quite some time until a vaccine is. That's just from what I've been reading and also because I can't imagine the science and work that goes into creating something like this. Plus then I, and this is just my thoughts, uh, if you've suddenly you've got the entire world needing the vaccine at once, it doesn't seem like there's gonna be enough of the vaccine to go around or even syringes or that sort of thing. So even, you know, if we get a vaccine, it's probably still gonna be another six to 12 months before it starts filtering around populations enough to take us back to something resembling what our old normal was. So plan B is, seems to be to live with the virus as it is and to sort of treat it like we treat the flu, just perhaps more contagious. I think you will see a lot more localised lockdowns. I'm not sure if you'll see a lockdown of what we've had again, uh, unless things get rapidly out of control because the stop start will probably be even worse uh, from the government's thinking for the economy than, uh, than what's happening right now. But I think you'll see areas locked down. So we've got a community outbreak here. You're going into stage three restrictions and sort of a ring put around that. And I think that will be the new normal. Maybe we'll all end up like the guy on YouTube that was walking around with a two metre square box around the centre <laughs> of him yeah, possibly, through Hong possibly. Kong. That, that was his exclusion zone. And we could use that at the pub, I reckon. When, when we were locking down and we had to have only one person per four square metres, we did that. We played by the rules absolutely because we had to. Um, but, you know, it just meant that there was 20 people in the corner rather than 100 people spread out. Like <laughs> people have drinks and they just, you know, get further and closer and closer together kind of what we do as humans. Um, so I'm not yep. sure plan B is going to be hard. Mel, are you there? I certainly am. Can you hear me? Yeah, go mm -hmm. for it. That's great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I wanted to ask um, the panel or, or, or Amy actually, um, if uh, you have looked at the conspiracy theories um, in your daily news reading and you're obviously following of all what's going on around the world. Uh, so conspiracy theories as in where the virus came from or... Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> in regard to where the virus came from, but also the volume that is coming out, and I understand there is a, 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 let's say, a pregnant pause in the world right now. So there's a lot more noise uh, on social media around, you know, um, not just um, the virus, but also the vaccines, uh, plus 
you know, a lot more uh, magnifying of those in very powerful positions. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I am, I am reading them and I am also reading how they're being de debunked um, and just trying to be as responsible as I can as a journalist uh, when I see it popping up in the blog. So I spend quite a bit of time reading through the comments of people who read my blog just to see uh, what people are talking about, what's taken their interest. And if I do see a particular uh, topic come up quite a bit, I will then do what I can to track down the information that I have on hand on that to sort of say, well, look, this is what what is happening. Uh, you know, you may have heard this, but it's not true. I'm not actually really on Facebook um, because I find it a little too overwhelming in terms of uh, conspiracy theories and quite exhausting uh, working to debunk what is happening on a lot of the social media feeds. I spend enough time talking to my dad and trying to debunk whatever it is that he has picked up uh, from his time watching Sky or, you know, listening to Alan Jones. And it, it takes a lot of energy because it, it's, it's really hard to disprove a negative, like really, really hard. I could just feel like, well, the sky's purple today. And you could spend a lot of time telling me why that's not actually true and just be like, well, you know what? I believe it's violet. So you've got your own opinion. And that's kind of what you can find that you're arguing with. In terms of where the virus came from and how it's being amplified uh, in certain sections of the media and uh, certain administrations, uh, I think, and I, I remember speaking to an, an expert about this quite some time ago, I think people find a lot of comfort in conspiracy theories because it's a lot more comforting to think that there is somebody in control of this rather than it just randomly happened. It's a lot more uh, secure thinking that, you know, there is like a big shadowy giant world government out there who are causing these sorts of things rather than just, you know, a bat possibly made us sick. And I'm from Queensland, uh, where we have quite a serious uh, virus called the Hendra virus, which came from bats to horses to humans, uh, and has caused uh, quite a few deaths there. So I'm quite familiar with how uh, viruses can jump from animals to humans. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I don't think that uh, people think a lot about the research that is happening in the backgrounds about how these viruses jump from, um, from animals to humans. And so when they read that the CSIRO, for instance, in Geelong has been working with international researchers on, you know, bat viruses, it's very easy to make the jump to, well, maybe one escaped. I don't see how it actually solves anything to, to be thinking that way. I don't see how it solves anything to be rushing forward without evidence rather than to make people more afraid or more xenophobic or just, you know, more awful than they're already being. So I tend to try and debunk where I can uh, and then just try to keep an eye on what is happening so I can start researching or speaking to experts to kind of catch that wave as it comes. Thanks a lot. Um, I just want to remind people, uh, we've got about 10 or so minutes left, that this is part of a pandemic webinar, uh, sorry, the economics of a pandemic webinar series that is being hosted by the Australia Institute, um, usually by Ebony. Uh, we have at least one a week and next week we are going to have Professor Ross Garno talking with Dr. Jim Stanford and Dan Naum. Um, who both work at the Centre for Future Work, which is a part of the Australia Institute. And that'll be on Friday. So it's actually this week, Friday the 8th of May. And it'll be from 2 to 3 p.m. So um, I'd encourage everyone to join us for that if they're available at that time. Because we've got time for a couple more questions, Roland, um, I will actually... Uh, I'll come to you right now, Roland. I'll see if you're there. And um, let's see. Roland, would you Ronald, like to I ask think. a question? Um, sorry, Roland, I'm trying to unmute you, but it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, nope. 
Ebony, we've got a question from Quentin from the media on the media, but I can't see it. Are you able to ask that one? Uh, I'll find, I'll see if I can find one from Quentin, but Jacob earlier um, had a good question. Jacob K. Amy, he asked if you are optimistic or pessimistic about the future of news media in Australia in terms of commercial concentration and I guess, you know, what's happening with coronavirus. Uh, um, hi, Jacob, if it's the Jacob that I'm thinking of. Um, am I optimistic? You kind of have to be in this industry because it's um, constantly under threat of closing. Uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly a booming one and hasn't been since the 90s in terms of, of uh, support for journalism. And in a lot of cases that is deserved, but in a lot of cases it's quite difficult to, um, to continue having to try and, and do your job at the quality that you think your audience deserves with less, uh, less people, with less and less people. But that's the world that we're all living in, so um, can't complain too much about that. We are seeing um, papers, regional papers in particular, close all over the country. We are seeing regional TV stations close all over the company, uh, country. We have seen funding for the ABC cut by hundreds of millions of dollars and yet we sometimes forget that so much of our population lives in those regional areas who are no longer being served by the media. It is no use doing a bulletin in Sydney for Wollongong because it's, it's, it's different news. There's no use doing a bulletin out of Brisbane or even Mackay for Winton and Longreach. It's just, it's it's not good enough for the people who live in those communities because we don't, we shouldn't be so city um, focused. It's, it's not healthy to just think that news only happens in a couple of markets here. So I'm really worried to see what is happening uh, in, in regional media in particular. Um, uh, people may have been following some of the media news. I'm sorry, that's, um, that's my dog Marley, who's decided to do some performance drinking there. So it's the noise that you're hearing. Um, I'm, if people have been following it, there's like the Institute for um, Public Journalism, which has been tracking a lot of the closures that have been happening. Um, but they might have also seen in media tidbits that uh, even big companies like News Corp are asking employees to take unpaid leave uh, as they try to watch their bottom line. So I think that it's going to be really, really difficult for media moving forward in this country. Uh, and I think that it's going to be particularly difficult for anybody in a region where they don't have multiple media sources. And I don't think that that is something that Australia as a whole should accept. You shouldn't accept that your media just comes from one source. You shouldn't accept that particular commercial interests can have so much power over your media. And you certainly shouldn't accept or be okay with papers that have served communities for over a hundred years closing and there being absolutely no hope that that gap is going to be filled. I mean, I'm very lucky at The Guardian and I'm very lucky with our subscriber base and I'm really, really lucky that people think that what I do is worth supporting. But it's just as important in regional communities, if not more so, that people support what's happening there too. So, yeah, I am worried about it. Mm. Um, slightly off the pandemic uh, topic of Amy, but do you think that the government's plans to force Google and Facebook to pay for content will come to fruition? Will they will they succeed where other countries have failed? In oh yeah, sure. I mean, Australia is definitely going to succeed where the EU and the US have failed. We've got so much market power. Yeah, they're definitely going to be worried about that. <laughs> Um, that's that's good. I, I, I feel I feel good about that is going to happen. Um, I just want to also before we wrap up remind people that they can listen to our podcast or sign up for updates at tai tai .org .au. And if they are in a position, if anyone out there is in a position to at the moment, I know that lots of people aren't to help chip in to put these webinars on and the other work that we do. That would also be very greatly appreciated. Um, I guess I would like, you know, we haven't got uh, talking pictures to throw to Amy, but if we were on Insiders now, and if you're back there in your PJs and you were asked for final observations or comments, 
what would you what would you like to leave us with? What do you think? What can you see coming up in the more immediate future? What will take up your time over this coming week? It, it's it's absolutely going to be the economy, uh, and it's going to be the shift to whatever the new normal is. And I think that now is the time for people to become even more engaged in their politics. It's so easy to just kind of shrug your shoulders or put your head down and just say, well, nothing's going to change, so why should I, why should I bother? We're living in a new world and we're living in a world where all the rules that we knew before and all the systems that we saw are starting to crumble. So if people don't actually stand up now, and I'm not urging revolution, obviously, I don't want to see you know, oh, another okay. era take to the streets, <laughs> but I do think that... People need to actually make their voices heard. And the more engaged you are in politics, and I don't necessarily mean at a federal level, like what's happening in your local communities and your own world is just as important in, as what is, happens in Canberra. If you stand up and start talking about what you think needs to happen, like hammer your MPs, hammer your representatives, be loud, like go in try and organize meetings, listen to as many people as possible, but just actually stand up and have your voice heard and particularly encourage those who don't care to start caring because more so than ever, this is a world that we need to shape and we do need big ideas and we can't just rely on the systems and paths that we've been on. So that's my final observation is just to stand up, to talk, and to make sure that you're heard because we all need it. And Amy, can I just say that was perfect timing, just as you said that everyone should stand up and be heard. Your screen flipped again to the, to the picture <laughs> of you with your skirt hoiked up, standing on a table. <laughs> yes, the most professional to more gallery, it's what I do. <laughs> oh, that was terrific. Look, it was a real shame that we couldn't have Sam here, um, yeah. but it's been so lovely talking to you for the past hour and having you share your thoughts. And, you know, thanks so much also for just um, taking up, you know, being prepared to talk for 100% of the time rather than 50%. <laughs> you met the challenge well, you exceeded your KPI there. And um, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, as I said, we've got more coming. We've got at least one a week. We've got Ross Garno on Friday. And as Ebony likes to say at the end of all of these webinars, stay safe, stay at home, and keep washing your hands. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Leave meaning in the corner. Bottom yeah, right. I just couldn't get to it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks,